Hi everyone, this is Neil Reitertair, also known as the Wax Whisperer. Thank you for joining me in my latest video. Now guys, I'm sincerely hoping that these there's two procedures. Uh, uh, patient one, this is their left ear, and patient two will be their right ear. So these videos, um, I'm, they were in my archive, um, but not down as being uploaded. So I sincerely hope I haven't previously uploaded them. I don't think I have. I did square through um, my uh, uploaded content and I couldn't find these. So uh, if anyone does find it, I'm really, really sorry, but hopefully they're not on there already. So patient one, um, left ear, they've got this wax plug and it's engulfed um, in this layer of skin. So the skin is somewhat semi-shed. It's not fully off the canal wall but it's wanting to and if you look really really closely you can see that the skin is still in its lamella structure it's in a thin sheet you can actually see the adhesions the connections in between individual skin cells so as this skin approaches the entrance of the ear canal not only should the skin um, start coming away from the canal wall which obviously it's failing to do in this patient and that could be for a number of reasons it could be that these bonds are very strong, but these bonds are also broken down by hydrolysis, so any moisture. So our ears naturally pick up moisture. Um, so we don't need to really put any additional water in, but it, they break down the bonds and there's special enzymes that are secreted by the skin cells themselves. So these skin cells are self-destructive. They are, um, when they are first created by stem cells at the really the, the deeper layers of the epidermis, um, they are programmed to self-destruct, if you like. So when it reaches the surface of the ear canal, this individual skin cell is called a, um, a keratinocyte. It, it's, it's firstly uh, created um, at the basal layer, which is kind of the fifth layer down of the epidermis, and slowly it's pushed towards the surface. And as it goes to the surface, it undergoes many um, characteristic changes um, until eventually when it reaches the surface, it becomes a dead skin cell full of keratin. Um, but when it reaches the surface, um, it also releases enzymes. So these enzymes then help break the bonds between individual skin cells so it can flake away and shed. And here it really hasn't. Um, so I've got the lateral section of the wax. This is more medial. It's quite impacted. Uh, it's a bit firmer here as well. Just put some medical grade olive oil just to help lubricate it. And slowly but surely bringing it forwards. So it's, it's really matured wax, it's oxidised, it's quite dark. And we're nearly there. So it's just coming away from the isthmus, uh, about five or six millimetres away from the eardrum. We have a natural narrowing, and that's what an isthmus is called. Uh, it's just a medical term. Given. Well, I don't even think it's this medical term. I think it's used in other industries as well. So you can see the narrowing there and the ear canal widens. Just a bit of debris at the base. Uh, can tell this patient has been using has been getting some water in it's just the skin's quite macerated so when we mean macerated the skin cells themselves are actually hydrophilic they like to absorb water and if they absorb too much water um, they begin to swell and overhydrate, and then they can kind of become a bit wrinkly and burst as well um, so i can just see the eardrum's got this wrinkly appearance the floor of the ear canal it kind of goes down and up again so it's a bit of a ditch there you can you see the orientation? It's almost like you can see the mountain peak. The ear canal goes up uh, where the isthmus is, where the ear canal narrows, and then it widens and it drops down. So you can see the bottom part of the eardrum, the infant where we are now. So that ear just needs to dry up. So this is another patient, although the ears look very similar. You wouldn't be mistaken to think that they are the same patient, but they're not. And with this patient, the angle is a bit different the way I'm working at because the patient preferred... Uh, actually laying down on the couch so look, when I treat my patients they're normally sat upright uh, on the ENT chair that I've got um, but this particular patient they just preferred laying down so the way you're seeing this ear is actually a bit different so imagine the ears rotated anti-clockwise or counterclockwise I think is in America I think I got told off before if I, in the UK we call it um, anti-clockwise uh, but I think in the States you call it counterclockwise 90 degrees I believe that's the orientation. So um, what would be the north of the eardrum? So the superior aspect is actually the posterior. It's on the left. Now, this technique can actually be a bit easier for some people to use an endoscope because 
when the patient is sat upright, not only do you have to, uh, to straighten the ear canal, in the case of the writer to the left, you then have to go up a bit. When the patient's laying down horizontal, all you're having to do is actually rest the endoscope on what would be the back portion of the ear canal and push it down. So you're not having to manipulate it left and right, which is the tricky bit. So you just put, bring it down. But the downside of it is that the ear canal, when it's in its normal orientation, you have a, it's an oval, the height is greater than the width. And you use that to your advantage. You have the endoscope to the bottom of the ear and you have the, um, the instrument over the top. In this orientation, it's the the width is superficially wider than the height, so the instrument is going side by side with the endoscope. So there's still obviously because the width is greater, there's obviously a bit more wriggle room there, but you're at risk of the two instruments crossing over and colliding. So, um, but it, yeah, it is another method. Um, I prefer patients sat. I think a lot of patients themselves prefer being sat upright. Uh, especially elderly patients, it's a bit difficult for them to, to lay back on a couch. And sometimes when they do, they can suffer f uh, from uh, a positional vertigo. It's called B9 uh, proximal positional vertigo. It's normally when you lay back beyond the uh, uh, perpendicular and that you tilt your head to one side. It Essentially, without going into too much detail, uh, you've got the organ of balance, which are three semicircular canals that are located in the inner ear. And within those, you have uh, what we call uh, calcium carbonate crystals. Uh, another name is the proper name is otolinth, uh, uh, or otonia, if I remember, uh, otoconia. I think I'm not. I don't really um, use that term, but I know there's a second term given to these crystals. But otolinth is the term that I'm normally using. And when you position your head in a certain orientation, these basically these crystals. Um, they exit one of these semicircular canals uh, into and they enter another where they shouldn't be and it just tricks the brain to thinking you're moving. And then you can suffer from violent uh, vertigo and nausea and even sickness. And it kind of just lasts about a minute until these crystals settle, but that minute can seem a very, very long time if you're that patient. Um, and then eventually the crest crystals settle. Then there is uh, an exercise called the Epley Maneuver or um, the two, which is designed to relocate these crystals. So... You can see the right and left ear of these two patients look look very similar. They look like they are from the same patient, but they're not. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. Take care, keep well, and speak soon. Bye.